You may not realize this, but for the past four days, we've actually been giving you challenges that are increasingly more challenging. We want to test you and prepare you for your final test today. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to lead you into another space, a space that you have not seen before. This space is going to be part of a museum of rooms. Come up with a word for that space for the museum of rooms. And working together and with your mentor, you are going to pick an object, or it could be a couple of objects, from Chipstone that you believe would be best interpreted or better interpreted or interpreted in a new way in that space. And then at the end of it, we want you to share your interpretation with us and with the world. You've been working in this space for years. You know each item's place. Here, at your workbench, you've collected the ingredients to cure many ailments. Butterfly wings, milkweed, porcupine quills. Some you gathered just the other day, others you've been drying for months. By portioning each element, then grinding them together, you lose yourself in your work. Here is where your patient Anna sat to consult with you last week. You prescribed a remedy for lovesickness and wrapped her dosage in parchment tied with twine. While Anna came to collect her parcel today, you send prescriptions to people across the county. Your space is one of discovery and transformation. You gather and collect to heal the body, but also the mind. Hours upon hours are spent here, some in the meticulous work of cutting, proportioning, and packaging, and others in calm contemplation and study. This is your mind on display, all its oddities and irregularities, seemingly random, but all particularly placed. It's easy to lose yourself in the mess, but really, here is where you naturally find yourself. So the first time that we walked into this room, I think that we all experienced this idea of whimsicality and transformation, and that this is a space that tells us obviously a very active story about somebody who's are collecting a lot of things, they have a lot of curiosities about the world and about science and nature, and then they're going to meticulously kind of explore and dissect. And so when we're picking objects to add to the room, we're really focusing on that lived-in feel. So we were finding objects that didn't just match color-wise, but also kind of added something a little different. By gathering evidence from the room, we sort of came up with this story of perhaps a country doctor or a pharmacist who took natural ingredients like butterfly wings, like milkweed, like seashells, and came up with remedies to help his clients, his patients. This is a Bellamine stoneware jug from the Chipstone Collection. We chose this because it has kind of another life to it. Sometimes these jugs were called witches' jugs, though originally they would have been used for transporting wine or storing oils and things like that. Um, they kind of took on a different function or an afterlife perhaps, um, in that people would find little nails um, stored in them and hairs and perhaps human skin and they were often used to kind of ward off bad spirits. So this 1760s agate wear creamer, we chose this piece because of its animalistic feet as well as how it was made, where the clays, the different colored clays, were ground together just as these medications and potions might have been ground together in the mortar and pestle. So this is a tin glazed earthenware salt pitcher. It's late 17th century. This is a circa 1770s porcelain sweet meat dish that we've sort of repurposed to hold uh, the same sort of ingredients. You can see on its sides natural elements such as shells and barnacles, which sort of coincide with our doctor's collection of natural materials. Well, our final piece we chose was this bowl. And while we were drawn to it because of how it looks, we were especially drawn to it because of the craft. And the chair at the workman station has a leg that has been fixed and repurposed, tied together with twine, and we thought the crack in the bowl very much mimicked the chair in that way. Wait, there's teeth over here. There are teeth? <laughs> oh my gosh. Wait, is that, a, is that a bat? Is that a dead bat? I think so. Oh God. So this room was 
actually really challenging to have an idea on what we wanted to do with it. So we started off thinking of emotions that this room evoked from all of us. Some of these emotions were coldness, loss of time. We felt trapped in the deconstruction of the space. Yeah, the room definitely does away with your sense of a tradition. There are no just four corner walls. Angles are changing, there's distorted shapes. The geometry is really powerful here. Instead of contrasting the space, we decided to move, go with it and you know plan something that complemented the space. Also in this space, everything fits. Furniture, walls, floor, colors, everything becomes one. We definitely wanted to add more context and concept. We had a general idea of what we were looking for such as the temporal space in this room, the time issue. Color was also really important, especially the lack of color. Uh, but there is one cube in the room that has yellow uh, lines across it. Can we find yellow objects to continue this, this color scheme? Because even though the room was really cold to us in the beginning, we start noticing the human hand on the painting, in the wall, the lines. Uh, the furniture. So the objects we chose uh, were common objects. Luckily all had iPhones, so we were able to have something that looked the same. Instead of thinking, okay, let's all go choose one object, we were able to, whatever inspired us, whatever fit, just take photos, bring it. And then photography become another issue to consider and consider what we frame on the pictures and what do we want to really represent on the space and what can really project the idea that we have of losing track of time and feeling futuristic or being abstract. And it was intentional, the photos that are displayed on the iPhone screens, that they don't show you where they are. All that you know is they're in this room. We also strategically placed the furniture in the room to kind of guide the viewer in the way that we wanted them to, so directly to each phone. The time shows in the future, 2028. So it, ha it really does embody that loss of time or the escape of time. One of the aspects that came after reading the piece that we thought was really interesting and poetic was that uh, the iPhones are actually working with a battery and this battery eventually is gonna die. So when the batteries die, we are, the image of the viewer is gonna be reflected on the glass. And this is like the symbology of dying and time and temporality. And it adds a humanity back into the room. The transitory nature of life. Can you smell the dust and breathe in the, the paint chips and the stale air? The debris. It's pretty forever. Absolutely. Yeah. If you just imagine like a shockwave of force, of energy just you know blasting through this space. It's like a negative. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, right. a oh, negative cool. image. If you look outside, you can just see the, the world just covered in ash. This, it's like ash and rain as the flakes come down. Yeah. And gray snow. Even though this is a site where terrible things have happened, it's being re-inhabited and it has a future. It has a new life that is being represented by all these objects. These are scavenged objects. Both for, for survival, for his personal survival, but also to remember the past. So he's looking through piles of debris and ash and whatever he can find. There's this violin over here. This is a remnant of, of a culture, of the, the pinnacle of human achievement of a beautiful violin that have now come undone. An instrument where there can be no music. So it's, it's an instrument with no sound. Exactly. So he hears it in his mind, but he doesn't right. play it. Right, you talk about this urn over here, mm -hmm. the contrast of beauty in... That was survived almost in totally intact. Yeah, it's right. pretty amazing. amazing. He must have it's amazing. been you know, pushing his way through these piles of ash and yeah. pulling it out, maybe you know, brushing it off and finding this complete object. What does it mean to have an object like this that holds ash and in a world that is surrounded and filled and, and saturated with ash? What do we know about it? 
Well, we know that he's kept a few items here. He's been a photograph of a, of a man, perhaps Stanley Stone, the man who used to own this, this property. He can't even see his own reflection. He hasn't seen another human in years, and that here is, is a human face. I had always heard that he, the things that he owned, he thought would be possessed by a foundation he left behind, and it would be here forever. But, I mean, this is forever? It's gone. Right. It, yeah. I mean, the question of, of permanence. And, right. And in an instant, mm -hmm. something could really be gone, destroyed. Right. That's very pretty wild. Yeah. This degree that's been tucked behind this radiator, so perhaps you know this object was was kept in the room where he found it and sort of stored it away. But what does this diploma mean now? That right. like, there is no Yale. The only thing that matters is not your understanding of Sophocles, but your understanding of how to purify water that is unsanitary to you know sweep away ash, find food. These things that they don't teach you in a, in an Ivy League seminar room. Yeah. yeah. And yet we still see this the inhabitant of this room showing an intellectual pursuit. It was a blank slate, you know, we had all of the wiggle room in the world to put in whatever objects we wanted. The, the narrative space that we have here, the narrative freedom, mm -hmm. is very real. I sort of thought when, when Ariel made this comment about using the mud chair, was mm -hmm. I, I immediately, I think, I had been thinking very linearly. Mm -hmm. Thinking like, okay, so this, this is an apocalypse that happens, and then like this, what, what, you know, what follows yeah. what? Mm -hmm. But then thinking about this, maybe this is a, a cyclical narrative. That like, right. we can right. think about this, you know, at the, 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 the dusk of humanity is also brings us very close to its dawn. Mm -hmm. When we think about the things at the very beginning of civilization that we, we use to, you know, get to our essential humanness, which I think, you know, mud is, is right. such an essential element. Okay. And, such and I think the word that you used was primordial. Mm -hmm. Going back to that beginning, that dawn. Being able to rebuild. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's something I'd be curious to know is, you know, what happens? That we've, we've really left the narrative open. open. And I think, yeah. like, you know, where, what does this survivor do? Does he actually survive? Does humanity, like, continue to flourish? Do we yeah. rebuild right. ourselves? Is this right. a, a cycle that we then repeat and like, fall into another apocalypse?